I would argue that his tips and suggestions are maybe not the best for hypertrophy due to a lot of contradicting statements he's making that conflict with the research. Business is occurring already, and I'm gonna speed run this intro because this we've got a lot to get through today. The TFNL coaching waiting list is still a thing, so if you are interested in applying for TFNL coaching, which will be opening up new slots in the near future, then please do consider clicking the button, the button, the thing down below in the description box, and fill in the form, and I can contact people directly when I have more slots available, very cool. And today we're gonna to be covering two lower body workouts to some extent. And we're actually looking at two different creators today. We're looking at Obi, and we're also looking at Jeremy, two very popular names in the comment section, very popular names in the DMs with people asking me to have a look at them. And I figured it'd be interesting to have a look at two different almost like approaches to leg days and then we can almost compare the two between Obi's approach and Jeremy's approach, give my opinion on both of them and maybe talk about whose approach I, I would personally favour. I think that might be quite interesting and quite fun. But obviously before we do so, you know what needs to be done. If at any point throughout this entire video you decide that you either like the video or perhaps you even learned something from this video, then please do consider either liking the video or maybe even subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week twice a week. And if you have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video, then please do consider dropping it down below in the comment section for comment question of the week and I shall do so. Three hats left, including today, before Halloween season is over. Oh, that makes my forehead look horrendous. It's annoying that, first of all, this really highlights how pale I am, but also look how big it is. Like, I'm not filming the video down here. That's in back, I'm stuck. Oh, <laughs> we're looking at Obi's the perfect leg workout to build big, strong legs. And it's key to know that kind of Obi's similar approach is a bit of a mix between hypertrophy and CrossFit, it seems. So that's what I'm gonna kind of base this analysis on, give my opinion on a few things following that. But like I said, we're gonna skip the warm up because obviously it's just a warm up. I've covered warm ups a lot before and I don't wanna go through it too many times. But essentially, how I would approach a warm up is a short period of low intensity, steady state, five to 10 minutes or so, followed by mobility and dynamic stretches that are appropriate to the movements you're gonna go through. So leg workouts, you typically do lower body mobility that takes you through similar movement patterns like squats, etc. First exercise is a front squat. I'm actually doing a cross body, however you can do a front rack position if you prefer, or you can use weightlifting straps if you don't have a very good front rack position. Using weightlifting straps for front squats is actually fantastic. So a lot of people don't have the mobility to get into either crossbody position or more like Olympic lifting position. So if you aren't able to do either of those things and straps are definitely a consideration. So I like that. Don't see a lot of people promote that. So it's good to see, because obviously at the end of the day, if you want to include this movement for your goals, you need to get in position somehow so it makes sense to get in position in the best means for you. So Obi speaks about a tempo here, two to three second tempo. Ultimately, this is more for control purposes. I know he does go on to mention about time under tension and things like that, which I will cover shortly. But again, I think timing your tempo, unless it's for technique purposes, doesn't really have a mass time or place. I think ultimately it is very much about controlling the movement, how you need to control it, and then exploding through the concentric portion. So controlling the way down, exploding the way up. But again, I would definitely implement tempo work or specific tempo work in which I'm timing the tempo if I were to do it for technical purposes. I think the front squat is a really good movement for like Olympic lifting and CrossFit and that kind of more functional side of things. But from the, the perspective of hypertrophy, it's not particularly fantastic. There are a lot of limiting factors as Obi did allude to earlier. We spoke about obviously the core being heavy worked you're ultimately doing this movement specifically for your legs and largely for the quads i should say the last thing you want is the core to be a limiting factor to prevent you from being able to train the quads effectively thus reducing how effective and efficient this movement is for quad hypertrophy but again if you're more into crossfit and olympic lifting you need to get good at front squats it's a pretty fundamental movement for those sports so in that case i would definitely include them split squats you know my thoughts and opinions on split squats every time i think about them they give me nightmares every time i think about them i'd probably consider calling my therapist again but at the end of the day just because they cause me pain and suffering doesn't mean that i shouldn't do them because they're a great movement and again elevation of the front foot can obviously increase range of motion so the knee can go a bit lower but if you're doing this more for like the quads for example i would actually not elevate the front foot itself but elevate the front heel which kind of already is doing with these olympic lifting shoes because that can promote a bit more knee travel and knee flexion thus lengthen the quads further which obviously takes them them specifically through a greater range of motion which is what we like to see but no i think split squats are great you could do front foot elevated back foot elevated front heel elevated so many ways of approaching split squats and they're actually a really versatile movement so you can essentially just change them slightly each time you kind of do a new block of training to almost treat them like a new exercise each time when in reality you're actually just changing elevation 
tension of different points of the body. So like I said, back foot, front foot, heel, etc. Time under tension is key. And it's also part of progressive overload. Again, that's actually not necessarily true. So time under tension, although it was kind of theorized for many, many years, that was really fundamental when looking at building muscle. Do you want to stay under tension for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. Again, recently that it's coming to light, that's actually not that important. And there are some studies which have kind of shown before that highlight that time under tension isn't actually that great for hypertrophy. What muscles typically best respond to in a lot of cases is essentially slow down and then exploding up to the point where the muscles, when they fatigue, are forced to contract slower involuntarily. So no matter matter how hard you try and how hard you push, the contraction speed and the, the rep speed is gonna slow down, not because you want it to, but because you don't have a choice. And that's kind of what we look for, the involuntary slowing of the contraction. And when you said about time and tension being uh, part of progressive overload, again, progressive overload is simply, uh, is increasing the number of reps performed. So if you did five reps next week, you do six, that's progressive overload, or increasing the amount of weight to use. So if you use 10 kilos next week, you use 11 kilos, that's progressive overload. And that's it really. Like for example, if you're increasing the number of sets, that technically isn't progressive overload, that's more of a means of volume overload. Next exercise is the leg press. I am using a slightly narrow foot placement this is to focus more on my quads. A wider foot placement would be more on hamstrings. A bit of a misinformation there. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but essentially low and narrow, definitely quads, because again, we're encouraging more knee flexion. So encouraging the knees to bend more, and thus lengthen the quads more. Fantastic, love that. But going wider does not work the hamstrings. No squat or leg press is going to work the hamstrings. When you go wider, you typically have the potential to target more of the adductor muscles. And the adductor magnus kind of goes down and runs almost like along the hamstrings, which is why people often associate the feeling of hamstring burning when doing leg press to hamstring work when in fact it probably is actually just an adductor muscle working rather than the hamstrings working stick to the basics leg curl variations and hip hinge patterns like rdls good mornings stiff leg deadlifts etc and obi does actually go on to mention about how he doesn't stress about going too heavy on these movements i reckon leg press is the movement that is most almost neglected when it comes to ego lifting you go to the gym you're most likely to see someone load up a horrendous amount of weight on the leg press and half rep it when the reality is form is very important Important and form is key. No one cares about how much you leg press. Only you care about you having 400 kilos on the leg press. What I would care more about is seeing half of that weight, so 200 kilos, going through a full and solid range of motion than seeing 400 kilos being half repped. Ego lifting is just going to get you a one way trip to Snap City and the destination no one wants to visit. Trust me, I've been there a few times. I've left a nasty Yelp review and I probably won't return again, hopefully more introduction of the core here, not ideal when we're looking at hypertrophy, but although I do think the goblet score could probably have more of a time and a place when considering things like teaching and like technique. And you also look, you're going through much of the exact same range of motion as the front squat. The only difference is the load being used is substantially lighter on the goblet squat. So I, I would favor, if I was gonna choose between front squats or goblet squats, I'd favor a front squat, to be honest. Make sure you keep that tension in your quads during the eccentric phase of the exercise. I am not going ATG and by keeping a narrow stance, the aim is to focus on my quads and keeping it under tension. Limiting range of motion, so not going ATG, meaning astagross, to keep tension on the quads it doesn't make a lot of sense. The quads are what we consider to be hyper responders to stretch mediated hypertrophy, which means they respond really well to getting fully lengthened. So going ATG, so bump to the floor during squat movements and all those bits and bobs provides a huge benefit to the quads in particular. So limiting ROM to work the quads more, keep tension on the quads is counterproductive because they would actually better respond to an increase in ROM, so range of motion. Walking lunges, not a lot for me to really say about the walking lunges. I, I like them. Again, similar to the split squat, it's not quite as bad regarding emotional turmoil, but they do hurt me a bit. Let's look at approach number two, which is Jeremy. Bigger quads, five mistakes keeping your legs skinny. Interesting. Is it a personal attack, maybe? I'm unsure. We're going to skip the anatomy bits and bobs at the start because I kind of have covered this a lot in my growth guide series, which is always on my channel in its own playlist. And we're going to kind of skip to the, the main, the mistakes that people might be making because it's fun. I like doing stuff like this. Barbell squats are often recommended as the best exercise to grow bigger legs. One issue with barbell squats, however, is they demand a lot from your core and lower back muscles to help stabilize the weight. Yeah, again, that's actually a really fair point in the sense that, again, similar to the front squats, the, the barbell squats, I feel like when you're doing a, a squat pattern in general, like a, sorry, a free weight squat pattern in general, other areas are probably gonna fail before your quads do. So your breathing might fail first, your core might fail first, whatever it may be. Therefore, that almost reduces its effectiveness for the intended musculature being the quads because it's being held back by weak links of a chain. What we really want to do when looking at like optimize the effectiveness 
for muscle groups is taking them through ranges of motion or choosing movements that have less limiting factors and the limiting factor when reaching failure or near failure will be the muscles you want to train. So obviously Jeremy speaks about going onto the hack squat. Hack squats are fantastic. I think hack squats are great, pendulum squats are great and Smith machine squats are great. Don't get me wrong, I, I still like squats. I still think squats are uh, really good. I would say they're really good movements, but I would say hack squat, pendulum squats and Smith machine squats are even better movements in the realm of hypertrophy. Because again, less limiting factors, less stabilization involved, and less weak links to consider. And no, for those wondering, as shown in a recent 2022 review, machines don't seem to be any less effective at building muscle than free weights. Again, I would actually argue in, in a lot of cases that machines might be better than free weights for hypertrophy, because machines are essentially designed to take you through a range of motion intended to work the target musculature with as few limiting factors as possible because you don't have the stability aspects and all those bits and bobs. Oftentimes when you're lifting really heavy, stability becomes a factor. So for example, dumbbell press is something I can no longer really do at the moment because my dumbbell chest press has reached 70 kilos each, each hand, which is about 155 pounds each hand. I'm finding stability is the biggest limiting factor, even just getting in position. Therefore, for me to take my chest training to the next level and be able to push it further without worrying about the weak link of stability holding me back, I'm gonna to have to start prioritizing like plate loading machines and machines in general that take me through the desired range of motion, which is obviously converging humerus across the body, but with less of a stability factor to consider and hold me back. So again, in that sense, I do think machines might arguably be better than free weights for hypertrophy. Does that mean you shouldn't include free weights? Absolutely not. Ultimately, like I like doing free weight movements. And I think enjoying a movement in a lot of cases is actually reason enough to do it. So there are free weight movements which I know are not optimal. There are free weight movements which I know probably aren't that great, but I just really enjoy doing them. I think enjoyment of movement is really key because I'm never going to be a top level pro bodybuilder. I'm never going to be Mr. Olympia, but training is something I do consistently five times a week and I just love going to the gym. I want to have fun when I'm there. I'm not there just to purely optimize everything I'm doing. And I think a lot more people should probably consider of this approach too is you don't have to be perfect to everything you do optimal could always be more optimal you could always do better but you're more likely to stick to something if you actually enjoy it which then arguably could be op more optimal for you because you're going to remain more consistent with it and it's more sustainable just because the squats may not be quite as good as the hack squats or the quads if you prefer doing barbell squats then sure barbell squat if you want to enjoyment is a factor to consider being happy is a factor to consider and just having fun when training is a factor to consider again fitness is meant to enhance your life not hinder it. You don't need to hyper analyze things. I like going through the analysis of workouts because it's really fun and hopefully it can teach you a few tricks and tips that you could apply to your training to better improve your training. But you never have to stick to what I'm saying. It's merely just an opinion and input for you to consider. But again, if you enjoy what you're doing, then if it's not broken, don't fix it. It's been shown that the more forward your shin angle is, the greater the knee movement and the more the quads will be involved compared to the glutes and lower back muscles. Yeah, again, more knee travel, additional knee flexion, knees go over the toes, although obviously back in the day, everyone's like, well, knees shouldn't go over the toes when they squat. If you've got the mobility to do so, more knee travel and more knee flexion is gonna be better for the quads. Form, is, like I said earlier, is very important, but form is also very much dependent on the muscles you're looking to target. If you're looking at prioritizing the glutes during a squat pattern, you probably don't need to go as low and you probably don't need to worry about as much knee travel. But if you're looking at targeting the quads a bit more you probably do need to go lower and maybe worry more about knee travel again so form is very important but form should be adjusted depending on what you're trying to achieve and depending on what your goals in general are and also what your goals of that movement are and if you want to increase knee travel jeremy did actually go into this olympic lifting shoes are great raised heel put your feet on plates again great because of raised heel anything that kind of raises that heel slightly maybe half an inch to an inch will almost like make up for some ankle mobility deficits you may have which then will allow you to increase the amount of knee flexion you're experiencing thus allowing you to place great emphasis on the quads. Okay, do you need to? No, it's just a consideration. Remember how your quads are made up of four muscles? Well, one of them is special. It's called the rectus femoris. It attaches at the pelvis and travels down the middle of your thigh. Because of its unique anatomy, during classic leg exercises like squats and leg presses, the rectus femoris doesn't get very well activated when compared to the other three quad muscles. Squats aren't actually that great for the rec fem, but as Jeremy goes through now, leg extensions and sissy squats are both really good for the rec fem because you maintain that neutral hip positioning. So leg extensions typically a bit more effective for the shortened position, sissy squats a bit more effective for the lengthened position. So typically I would say an effective hypertrophy based leg workout or quad workout will include at least one 
of the, the two being either leg extensions or sissy squats because otherwise you risk neglecting training the right fem sufficiently. We know that to maximize growth, you need to push yourself hard enough during your sets to reach at least within three reps of failure. Even when training the upper body, research has shown that most people don't push themselves hard enough to reach this point. So typically my, my understanding, again, I hear different things from different people, but my understanding is the kind of green zone for hypertrophy is anywhere from zero to four reps in reserve. And what Jeremy says is actually a very fair point is that people notoriously aren't very good at gauging their proximity to failure. And I think especially for leg training, you can push your legs a lot harder than I think you think you can. So when you think you're at failure, you probably actually have a few left in the tank. When you think you're at three or four reps from, from failure, you probably might even be six seven or eight so again it's being honest with yourself but also having an accurate gauge of what your failure point is and being quite familiar with reps in reserve which is again is a skill in itself which does take time but i've seen a few bits of jeremy stuff i've seen him speak about time under tension a lot before which again is something i don't personally agree with but as a whole i think a lot of what he is pushing is actually seems, seems right ob seems to have like a more of a uh, hybrid approach like functional hypertrophy approach i would argue that his tips and suggestions are are maybe not the best for hypertrophy due to a lot of contradicting statements he's making that conflict with the research. But from a more functional perspective, I think he's adding in some good tips and tricks. So talk about heel elevation is good, the straps for the front squats, like things like that that could almost help people work around potential hindrances they may have. I think it's really good and actually really nice to see. Jeremy obviously be a lot more science-based. He's very much hypertrophy driven based on what I'm seeing here. And it's nice to see what he backs up his bits and bobs with evidence and science. Again, a few bits and bobs I'm not necessarily 100% in alignment with, but again, you've got to find what works best for you and then run with that and see how you get on. But as a whole, I think both of these creators have some really valid and fair points. Although personally, I would, for my goals anyway, I would lean towards Jeremy as I prefer his style of content and I prefer his approach to training as well. But now that's done, we're very quickly going to crack on with comments question of the week. And it's an interesting one, also very relevant to squats and those bits and bobs. Do you have any advice on weightlifting belts? I've had multiple open abdominal surgeries and I'm at higher risk for developing a hernia. I know I should talk to my doctor for my specific situation, but I'm curious if you have an opinion on them. I've seen lots of mixed reviews on their effectiveness. Again, I agree, you should definitely speak to your doctor before taking advice of a random man in a funny hat on YouTube. So uh, doc speaking to the doctor is definitely key and speaking to a relevant medical professional as I am not one. Provided you can lift effectively and can brace the core effectively without a belt, I think belts can be a great addition to enhance your training. It can also potentially reduce how much of a limiting factor your core is, thus allowing you to potentially lift heavier. And also, arguably, potentially allow you to lift safer. It's all about learning how to breathe into the belt and brace the core effectively against that belt, which is a whole nother video in itself. But yeah, I'm very much pro belts if you if you can use them properly and pro belts if you need them. Does everyone need a belt? Absolutely not. But if you feel that it would take your lifting to the next level and would align with your goals, then I fully support it. That is it. That is a video. Like I said at the start of the video, if you like the video, then please let me know you like the video by liking the video. And if you learned anything throughout this video, then please do consider clicking the red button down below to subscribe to the channel and maybe even the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week twice a week and if you too have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video then please do consider dropping it down below in the comment section for comment question of the week and I shall do so thank you for tolerating me thank you for tolerating my poorly sized headpiece today and thank you for tolerating the video